About 10 years ago, I started becoming obsessed with uh, the study of narrative, um, which came out of um, really realising that there was a desperate need for new writers uh, and they weren't being trained properly. So I started to uh, think about training them and in the process, obviously I had to teach myself first and out of that came the BBC Writers Academy and then I wrote a book um, about narrative structure and that's led to more work with writers. So yeah, I work with new writers all the time, yeah. I was very fortunate because I was, I, you know, I was, I was running EastEnders Casualty Holby Doctors, which meant that any ideas I had, I could test live on an audience. So I started to teach people, and as I, I began by teaching them the stuff that's in books already. But then you test it, put it on the air, and you go, well, that's not true. And so out of that, you start to evolve your own theory and understanding of how narrative works. Yeah, I was kind of always frustrated by the books that existed because none of the, although a lot of them say, you know, there has to be an inciting incident on page 27, none of them say why. That was my task and, you know, you just work out why over three or four years of testing, refining, writing, researching, etc. until you suddenly go, ah, oh, I get it makes perfect sense. There is a common shape which is you know every story has a beginning middle and end it's just a law of physics and you can't spend much time fighting that uh, um, but within that there are certain tropes that occur again and again uh, you know which will be familiar to most writers uh, and I grew up with lots of writers who were very anti that attitude and I was as well I think to begin with but my attitude now is oh don't why waste time fighting it it's just there, it's a product of human nature. Structure isn't something imposed by Sid Field. Sid Field was articulating a process that comes from within, just what we do naturally. You ask me a question, I answer it, your opinion of that subject changes, for better or worse. That's three hour structure. That's all it is, is structure comes out of the process of how we assimilate knowledge. You know, I go to a lecture about screenwriting, uh, I think it's going to be rubbish, uh, I listen intently, uh, it's brilliant. That's three act structure in the hero's journey. The other way around is I go to a lecture about screenwriting, I hear it's going to be brilliant, I listen intently, it's rubbish. That's the tragic version. Those are the fundamental shapes of all narrative structure and everything on top of that comes from that. You know, a protagonist always has to have a desire, you know, you know if you ask a question, you have to answer it. You know, the, all those basic tropes. There are caveats, which is, of course, some films and TV shows don't follow the rules of structure. Twin Peaks, the series, would be one example. Michael Haneke's The Blue, uh, the White Ribbon would be another. But when you watch them, you feel uneasy because they don't follow the rules of structure. So, in, you know, what they are is like free jazz playing against the melody of structure. The melody is implicit, you know it. Something that doesn't follow the melody makes you feel uneasy. And that's what those films are trying to do. They're trying to make you feel uneasy. So all that actually does is confirm the existence of structure. When I first started exploring story structure, um, the danger, you know, you, there's two things that are dangerous when you're debating. You, you confirmation bias, so you just look for things that support your thesis rather than look at the real world and analyse it possibly. So you have to fight that. But the other thing is, is like, really, if you're going to test the story structure, you have to read stuff that was written before Sid Field's screenplay. And the best place to go, of course, is Shakespeare, because, because he's no influence, as far as we know, of, of structural uh, methodology. Uh, there are some people who would argue with that, but largely I think, that, I think that's true. Uh, and if Shakespeare follows those rules, then that tells you something really important, which is that um, those rules are likely to be true and implicit and universal. And the great thing about Shakespeare is actually they're incredibly archetypal. They may be in five acts, but they're very archetypal. Basic structural theory is thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That's not a new thought, but that's basically I exist, I experience the world, I change. Uh, then what you look for is you look for a, the protagonist at the beginning of a story, then you look for them in the middle, and you look for them at the end. And 
what happens in Shakespeare is really interesting. So halfway through King Lear, the omnipotent king is naked in a hovel in the storm on the heath. Halfway through Othello, Othello swallows the Argos bait, he becomes gullible. Halfway through Romeo and Juliet, uh, Romeo uh, kills Tybalt and is banished and becomes an enemy of the people, so to speak. So what you get is a classic synthesis, antithesis synthesis all the way through Shakespeare. You know, normally around Act 3, Scene 3, this extraordinary thing occurs that turns the world on its head. Leo Banco is killed, Fleance escapes, or Leontes learns that uh, Hermione was not unfaithful. You know, so it's just there all the time in Shakespeare. In terms of structure, the, the biggest error, error is, the, is they don't know what to do with the middle act. Very soggy middle act. It shows no clear, no clarity. Uh, very often, and that sounds silly, but you give them note again and again. What does this character want specifically? That's a big problem. Uh, stories are chains of cause and effect, but a lot of the time you you get a selection of scenes that aren't this scene. This scene has got to happen because of this scene, but a lot of times you get this scene happens and then this happens and then this happens. That's not a story, that's a series of incidents. So that's a very common problem. Uh, and the other big tells at the beginning of reading a script, you know, because you can tell in a page if someone can write or not, is is their ability to hide exposition. You know, if you, you can see very quickly if someone can write exposition or not. Yeah. So exposition is the art of giving information. Uh, with a good writer, exposition is invisible. You don't know you're being fed it. A new writer, a bad writer, you know, you have characters telling you stuff and they wouldn't say that stuff in real life. So it's exposition without desire is the technical way of looking for it. The people who taught me the most, I was very lucky because uh, I was a commissioning editor so I got to work with you know, some of the very best writers in television and the people I learnt from uh, were Stephen Moffat, Tony Jordan, Jimmy McGovern but probably the most significant one was Jed Mercurio who I, I was commissioned on Bodies many years ago and just as I was getting interested in this stuff and Jed was obsessed with structure so I just used to pump his brain all the time saying tell me why you're doing that, why you're doing that, why you're doing that and, and he said to me, he said like you know dialogue isn't important, he said what's important is structure it's everything and that, that's when I really got things so, so he's, he's the governor the last show I watched was Big Little Lies, uh, which I thought was brilliant. I really, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a very, you know, that deceptively simple, brilliant idea of a murder in which you don't know who's died and you don't know who's done it. It's a really smart thing. Uh, I love The Americans, I think is extraordinary. Uh, I love uh, Gomorrah, the Italian, Sky Italian show, and Love Hate, the Irish show. You know, there's so much. You know, you have, those are just the ones I've watched. I can't talk about the ones I haven't watched. But yeah, it's a it's a brilliant time for television.